6. Refined and Unrefined It is popular nowadays to speak of refined and unrefined foods, and in particular of refined and unrefined carbohydrates. These terms are most often used in speaking of white sugar and of bread made from white flour. I deplore this custom for two reasons. The first is that the refining of sugar and of flour are not really comparable. White flour is made by the removal of the bran and germ, and perhaps some of the outer layers of the endosperm, the innermost part of the wheat berry. Everything that has been removed is in fact edible, and would have been eaten if the whole of the berry had been ground. Such flour would contain a hundred percent of the wheat berry. What is called wholemeal flour consists of 92% of the wheat berry, and white flour usually about 72%. On the other hand, the first stage in producing sugar from the cane is the preparation of the cane juice, which leaves behind the major part of the cane as inedible fiber and associated gums and insoluble materials. The following stages of clarification, precipitation, concentration and crystallization remove further unwanted materials, so that the resulting unrefined raw sugar represents only a small proportion of the original cane from which it was produced. This product is far removed from the original sugar cane. The fibrous bagasse from which the cane juice is extracted and the materials removed from the juice amount to well over 80% of the cane and what is removed is either inedible or undesirable. Raw cane sugar thus consists of about 20% of the original sugar cane, white cane sugar perhaps 15 or 16%. It does not make sense, therefore, to imply that unrefined sugar is somehow the whole or natural product of the sugar cane, while refined sugar is in some way unnatural or denatured. Thus, while the use of these terms, much as I dislike them, may to some extent be justified in regard to wholemeal flour and wholemeal bread, they are invalid where sugar is concerned. There is a second reason for pleading that you do not speak of refined and unrefined carbohydrate. It is true that refined sugar is the pure carbohydrate sucrose, while raw sugar is mostly this carbohydrate with small quantities of other materials. On the other hand, white flour is not, as some people imagine, virtually nothing but the carbohydrate starch. For example, white flour contains only fractionally less protein than does wholemeal flour, about 13% instead of about 13.5% and in many countries, such as the USA and the UK, some of the vitamins that are partly removed in the milling process are replaced by the flour millers. Moreover, other nutrients are sometimes added to a much higher level than was present in the original wheat grain. For example, calcium in the UK. Altogether, then, it is wrong to call white flour or white bread refined carbohydrate and particularly it is not sensible to put on the same nutritional level raw sugar and wholemeal bread or white sugar and white bread. Fibre There are many who consider that the dietary change most relevant to the pattern of disease in Western countries is the change from diets with a high proportion of unrefined foods to diets with a high proportion of refined foods. The evidence for this claim is largely the fact that the diets of people living in rural areas of Africa consist largely of fibre-rich unrefined cereals, and it is in these areas that coronary thrombosis and other diseases of affluence are rare. In the West, where these diseases are common, we have changed from eating brown bread to eating white bread so that our diet now provides substantially less fiber. This idea is based on the assumption that cereals are a sizable and natural part of the human diet. This is literally a short-sighted view. Cereals entered our diet less than 10,000 years ago, 
which is about one half of one percent of the period since we emerged as a separate species. Before this, for at least two million years, our ancestors were, like all other species, hunters and gatherers of food. The brief period since the advent of agriculture, which resulted in a diet containing large quantities of starch-rich, high-fiber foods such as cereals, is far too short for the human species to have completely adapted to such a diet. In other words, there has been far too little time in evolutionary terms for there to have been a significant genetic change toward any adaptation that may have been necessary for such a diet. And if our present-day diet is lower in cereal fiber than that of, say, a hundred or so years ago, then the trend is toward the sort of cereal-free diet eaten by our pre-Neolithic ancestors. This is one reason why I have not accepted the view that lack of fiber may be responsible for the diseases of affluence. A second reason is that, as we shall see, evidence gained by comparing populations, population epidemiology, can be very misleading. People in rural Africa or other parts of the Third World, live very differently from those in industrialized and urbanized parts of the world. Not only do we take less fiber, but we take more meat, fat, milk, sugar, and a range of other foods. We eat more in total. We are less active physically, smoke more cigarettes, and are more subject to industrial pollution. Finally, the experiments that have revealed the considerable changes in the body's metabolism that sugar can produce involved comparing diets containing pure starch or refined flour with diets containing pure sucrose. The many differences in the effects of the two diets could not, therefore, have been due to the presence or absence of fiber, but must have resulted simply from the presence or absence of sugar.' 